Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Summit North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the OpenStack Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman here with my co-host John Troyer and you're watching theCUBE's exclusive coverage of OpenStack Summit 2018 in Vancouver. Happy to welcome back to the program. Off the keynote stage this morning, Mark Shuttleworth, the founder of Canonical. Thank you so much for joining us. Stu, thanks for the invitation. All right, so uh, you, you've been involved in this OpenStack stuff for, for quite a bit. Right uh, I beginning. remember three years ago, we were down in the other hall talking about the, the maturity of the platform. I think three years ago, it was like this container thing was kind of new, um, and the basic infrastructure stuff was starting to get, um, in, in a nice term, boring, um, because that meant we could go go about business and beyond the buzz of, you know, oh, there's this cool new thing and we're going to kill Amazon, kill VMware, whatever else things that people thought that uh, had a misconceived notion. So uh, bring us forward to, you know, where we are, 2018, what you're hearing from customers as, as you look at OpenStack in this community. Well, I think you, you pretty much called it. OpenStack very much now is about solving a real business problem, which is the automation of the data center and the cost parity of private data centers with public data centers, right? So I think we're, we're at a time now when people understand the public cloud is a really good thing. It's great that you have these giant companies dueling it out to deliver better quality infrastructure at a better price, but that at the same time, having your own private infrastructure that runs cost effectively is important. Uh, and OpenStack really is the, um, the only approach to that that, that you know, exists today. Um, and it's important to us that the conversation is increasingly about what we think really matters, which is the economics of owning it, the economics of running it, and how, how people can essentially keep that in line with what they get from the public cloud providers. You know, one of the barometers I use for vendors these days is, in this multi-cloud world, where do you sit? Do you play with the hyperscalers? Are you a public cloud denier, or like most people, you're, you're, most people are somewhere in between. In your keynote this morning, you were talking a bit about all of the hyperscalers that use your products, as well as right. uh, I mean, we, the, the Ubuntu's at yeah. the heart of uh, um, all of the major public cloud operations at multiple levels. So we see them as great drivers of innovation, great drivers of uh, exposure of Ubuntu into the enterprise. Um, we are still by far the number one platform used in public cloud by enterprises. It's hard to argue that public cloud is test and dev now. It really, really isn't, right? And so most of that is still Ubuntu. And now we're seeing that pendulum swing, all of those best practices, that consumption of Ubuntu, that understanding of what a leaner, meaner enterprise Linux looks like, bringing that back to the data center is exciting, right? For us, it's an opportunity to help enterprises you know, rethink the data center to make it fully automated from the ground up. OpenStack is part of that, Kubernetes is part of that, and, uh, and now the sort of, the, the, the cherry on top is really AI, where people, people understand they have to be able to do it on public cloud, on private infrastructure, and at the edge. Mm. Mark, I wanted to talk about open source and marketing yeah. open source for a minute. We're obviously here, we're in a part of an open source community. Uh, open source is de facto has won the cloud technology stack wars, right? So there's one way of selling OpenStack where you, you, you pound on open a lot and, and you, 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 you... I'm always a bit nervous about projects that put open... You focus, it's, well... It sounds like they're sort of trying to gloss over something or wash over something or prove a point they shouldn't well, have to. There's right? one about the, the philosophy of open source, which certainly has to stay there, right? Because yeah. that's what drove the innovation. But what I was kind of impressed at, on the stage today, you talked about the benefits. You didn't say, well, Ubuntu's open. You said, well, no, we are facilitating these benefits speed to market, cost, et cetera. Can you talk about you know, your approach, Canonical's approach to talking about this open source product in terms of its benefits? Sure, look, open source is a license. Mm. Uh, with, under that license, there's room for a huge spectrum of interest and opinions and, and approaches. And I'd say that you know, we, I certainly see an enormous amount of value in what I would call the um, passion-based open source story. Now, OpenStack is not that. Right, it's too big, too complicated to be one person's deep passion. It really isn't, right? But there's still a ton of innovation that happens in our world across the full spectrum of what we see with open source, which is really experts trying to do something beautiful and ele elegant. And I, I still think that's really important in open source. You also have a new kind of dimension, which is almost like industrial trench warfare with open source, right? Which is huge organizations leveraging effectively um, um, the, the ability to get something 
widespread, widely adopted quickly and, and, and efficiently by essentially publishing it as open source. And often people get confused between these two ends of the spectrum, there's a bunch in between. Um, what I like about OpenStack is that I think it's over the industrial trench warfare phase. You know, you just don't see a ton of people showing up here to throw parties and prove to everyone how cool they are, right? They've, they've moved on to other open source projects. The people who are here are people who essentially have the real problem of, I want to automate my data center, I want to have essentially a cloud that runs cost effectively, um, in my data center that I can use as part of a multi-cloud strategy. And so now I think we're into that sort of, that, that uh, a more mature place with OpenStack. We're not either uh, sort of artisan or craftsman oriented, nor are we kind of um, um, a guns blazing brand oriented. It's kind of now just solving the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, we, there's still some naysayers out in the marketplace. Either they say that this never matured, there's a certain analyst firm that put out a report a couple of months ago that uh, it, it kind of denigrated uh, what, what, what's happening here, and then there's others that, as you said, off chasing that next you know, big wave uh, of open source. What, do, what are you hearing from your customers? You've, you're, you've got a good footprint around the globe, so. Um, so that report is nonsense for a start. They, they're always wrong, right? Whether if they're, if they're hyping something, they're wrong, and if they're sort of dissing something, then they're usually wrong too. They have a know. cycle for that, I believe. Exactly, yeah. it's like <laughs> selling gold at the bottom, right? Um, uh, here's how I, I see it. I think that um, uh, enterprises have a real problem, which is how do they um, create private cloud infrastructure. OpenStack had a real problem that it had too many opinions, too many promises, you know, essentially a governance structure, not a leadership structure, right? Our position on this has always been, focus on the stuff that is really necessary. There was a ton of nonsense in OpenStack, right? And that stuff is all failing, and so what? It was never essential to the mission. The mission is, stand up a data center in an automated way, provide it essentially as resources, as a service to everybody who you think is authorized to be there effectively, segment and operate that efficiently. And there's only a small part of OpenStack that was ever really focused on that. That's the stuff that's succeeding, that's the stuff we deliver, that's the stuff we, we think very carefully about how to automate it so that essentially anybody can consume it at reasonable prices. Now we have learned that it's better for us to do the operations almost. It's better for us actually to, to take it to people as a solution, say look, explain your requirements to us, then let us architect that cloud with you, then let us build that cloud, then let us operate that cloud, right? Until it's all stable and the economics are good, then you can take over, right? I think what we have seen is that if you, if you, if you ask every single different company to build OpenStack, they will make a bunch of mistakes and then they'll say OpenStack is, is the problem. Well, OpenStack's not the problem, right? Because we do it, again and again and again, because we do it in many different data centers, because we do it with many different industries, we're able to essentially put it on rails. And when you consume OpenStack that way, it's super cheap. I mean, we, 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 analysts have, it's not, these aren't my numbers, analysts have studied the cost of public infrastructure, the cost of the, the established incumbent enterprise sort of virtualization solutions and so on, and they found that when you, when you consume OpenStack from Canonical, it is much, much cheaper than any of your other options in your own private data center. And I think that's a success that OpenStack should be proud of. All right, you've always done a good job at poking at uh, some of the discussions happening in the industry. Um, it, I wouldn't say it was surprised, but you were highlighting AI as, as something that was showing a lot of promise. Uh, people have been a little hot and cold depending on what part of the market you're at. Um, Tell us about AI, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in general, kind of uh, Kubernetes, serverless, and, and as you to talk about some of those, those, those new trends that are out there. Sure, the big problem with data science was always finding the right person to ask the right question, right? So you could get all the data in the world in a data lake, but now you have to hire somebody who instinctively has to ask the right question that you can test out of that data, and that's a really hard problem, right? What machine learning does is kind of inverts the problem. It says, well, why don't we put all that data through a, 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 a pattern matching sort of system, and then we'll end up with something that reflects the underlying patterns, even if we don't know what they are. Now we can essentially say, if you saw this, what would you expect? And that turns out to be a very powerful way to deal with huge amounts of data that previously you had to kind of have this magical intuition to kind of get to the bottom of. So I think machine learning is real. It's valuable in almost every industry, and um, the challenges now are really about you know, standardizing the underlying operations so that 
the people who focused on the business problems can essentially use them. And so that's really what I wanted to show today is us working with, in that case it was Google, but you can generalize that, to standardize the experience for an institution who wants to hire developers, have them effectively build machine uh, driven models effectively and then put those into production. There's a bunch of stuff I didn't show that's interesting. For example, you really want to take the learnings from machine learning and you want to put those at the edge. You want to react to what's happening as close to where it's happening as possible. So there's a bunch of stuff that we're working on with various companies. It's all about taking that AI outcome right to the edge, to IoT, mm -hmm. to edge cloud. Um, but uh, we didn't have time to get into yeah, all of that and, today. And uh, Ubuntu is at the edge, right? Uh, in all their mobile so we're platforms. In the, we're in the great position yeah. that we're on the cloud. Yeah. Now you see what we're doing in the data center for enterprises, effectively recrafting the data center as a, as a much leaner, more automated machine, really driving down the cost of the data center. And yes, we're on, on, the, on the higher end things, right? We're never going to be on the light bulb. We're a full general purpose operating system. But you can run Ubuntu on a $10 board now and uh, that means that people are taking it everywhere. Amazon, for example, put Ubuntu on the deep lens. So that's a great example of AI at the edge. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's super exciting. So the, the Kubernetes serverless type applications, what, 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 are, what are your thinkings around there? Serverless is a lovely kind of way to think about the flow of code in a, in a distributed system. It's a really nice way to solve certain problems. What we haven't yet seen is we haven't seen a serverless framework that you can, that you can port Right, we have, we, we've seen great serverless um, experiences being built inside the various public clouds, but there's nothing consistent about them. You know, every, everything that you invest in a particular place is very useful there, but you can't imagine taking that anywhere else. Yeah, I think that's fine, right? Today it's primarily Lambda, so. Right, um, uh, and, and I think the other clouds have done a credible job of, of getting there quickly, um, but kudos to Amazon for kind of pioneering that. Um, I do think we'll see generalized um, serverless. It just doesn't exist at the moment, and as soon as it does, we'll, we'll be we'll be itching to kind of get it into people's hands. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to pull out something that you had said, but so in case people miss it, you talked about managed uh, OpenStack, and that I think managed Kubernetes has been a trend over the last year. Absolutely, yeah. Managed OpenStack now uh, these, has been a trend as well. With these complex pieces yeah. of infrastructure, now you could easily drown in learning it all, and if you're only ever going to do one. Maybe it makes sense to have somebody else do it for a while. You can always take it over later. So we're unusual in that we, we will essentially stand up something complex like an OpenStack or a Kubernetes, operate it as long as people want, and then train them to take over, right? So we're, we're not exclusively managed, and we're not exclusively kind of arm's length. We're happy to start the one way and then hand over. I think that's an important development, though, that's, that's yeah. been developing as these systems get more complicated. That uh, one Unix admin uh, you know, needs a whole new skill set or a broader skill set now that we're orchestrating a whole cloud. So that's, I think that's great. Uh, that's a, and I, it's interesting. Do you, anything else that you're looking forward to in terms of operation models? Uh, I guess we've said you know, Ubuntu everywhere from the, from the edge to the, to the center and uh, now managed as well. Anything else we're looking at in terms of operators should be looking at? Um, well, I think edge, edge is, is going to stay sort of murky for a while, simply because each different group inside a large institution has a boundary of their kind of authority, and to them that's the edge. <laughs> um, uh, and so the, the term is sort of heavily overloaded. But I would say ultimately there are a couple of underlying problems that have to be solved, and, 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 and if, you, if you look at the reference architectures that the various large institutions are putting out, they all show you how they're trying to attack these patterns using Ubuntu. One is physical provisioning. Like the one thing that's true of every edge deployment is there are no humans there. So you can't kind of band-aid over, over the idea that when something breaks, you need to completely be able to reset it from the ground up, right? So Maz, Metal as a Service, shows up in the reference architectures from AT&T and from SoftBank and from Deutsche Telekom and a bunch of others because it solves that problem, right? It's the smallest piece of software you can use to take one server or 10 servers or 100 servers and just reflash them with Windows or CentOS or, 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 or Ubuntu, whatever you need. That's one thing. The other thing that I think is consistently true in all these different edge cloud permutations or combinations is that overhead's really toxic. If you need three nodes of overhead for a 100 node OpenStack, it's 3%. For a 1,000 node OpenStack, it's 0.3%, right, it's nothing you won't notice it. But if you need three nodes of OpenStack for a nine node edge cloud, well then that's 30% of your infrastructure costs. So really thinking through 
how to get the overhead down is, is kind of a key for us. And in all the projects with telcos in particular that we're working, that's really what we bring, is that underlying understanding and some of those really lightweight tools to solve those problems. On top of that, they're all different, right? Kubernetes here, LXD there, OpenStack on the next one, you know, AI everywhere. Um, uh, but those two problems, I think, are the consistent things we see as a pattern in Edge. All right, so Mark, last question I have for you, company update. So last year we talked a little bit about focusing uh, you know, where the company's going, talked a bit about the business model, and you, know, you said to me, developers should never have to pay uh, for anything, it's, it's the, the governance people and everything like that. Um, give, give us the company update, I think everything from rumors from, you know, hey, maybe you're IPOing to you know, what, what, what's happening, what, what can you share? Right, so the, the, the twin areas of focus, IoT and, um, and cloud infrastructure. IoT continues to be an area of R&D for us, so we're still essentially underwriting uh, an IoT investment. I'm very excited about that, I think it's the right thing to be doing at, at the moment. I think IoT is the next wave effectively and we're in a special position. We really can get down um, both economically and operationally into that, that sort of small edge kind of scenario. Cloud for us is a growth story. We, um, uh, uh, I talked a little bit about taking Ubuntu and Canonical into the finance sector. In one year, um, we closed deals with 20% uh, of the top 20 banks in the world to build Ubuntu-based open infrastructure. So that's a huge shift from their traditional kind of dependence exclusively on VMware and Red Hat. Now suddenly Ubuntu's in there, Canonical's in there. Um, uh, I think everybody understands that telcos really love Ubuntu, and so that continues to grow for us. Um, uh, commercially, we're expanding um, uh, both in EMEA and um, uh, here in the Americas. Um, uh, I won't talk more about you know, our sort of corporate plans, other than to say I see no reason for us to sort of scramble to cover any other areas. I think cloud infrastructure and IoT is plenty for one company. Um, and uh, for me, it's a privilege to combine that kind of business with what happens in the Ubuntu community, right? I'm still very passionate about the fact that we enable people to consume free software and innovate, um, and we do that without any friction. We don't have an enterprise version of Ubuntu, right? We don't need an enterprise version of Ubuntu. The whole thing's enterprise, right? Even if you're a one-person one -person startup. All right, well, Mark Shuttleworth, always a pleasure to catch up. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. For John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman, back with lots more coverage here from OpenStack Summit 2018 in Vancouver. Thanks for watching theCUBE.